Um, <clears throat> Indiana is known for a number of things, like the Indy 500, basketball, some top collegiate universities, and corn. Um, but fashion designers, um, that one might come as a surprise. But today, I'm going to talk about the top three American fashion designers that all have the roots in Indiana. So we have Norman Norell, Bill Blass, and Halston. So the first I'll talk about um, is Norman Norell. He is famed for his elegant gowns, suits, and tailored silhouettes. The Metropolitan Museum of Art called him the father of high, American high fashion. He was the first American designer to have his name on a dress label, as well as the first successful designer named Fragrance, which you can see in the lower corner. Um, but his greatest contribution is to the Council of Fashion Designers of America, which he founded. So he was born Norman David Levinson in April 1900 in Noblesville, Indiana. His father owned a haberdashery, which you can see in the picture. Um, and this influenced his design aesthetic as he favored a more minimal, sophisticated silhouette and elements of menswear. Norman arrived in New York City in 1919 and studied fashion illustration and design at Parsons Schools of Design and Pratt Institute. Norrell changed his surname while at Pratt he described his name changed as Nor for Norman, E.L. for Levinson, and another L added for looks. <laughs> um, but after school, um, he began his career by joining the New York studio of Paramount Pictures, um, designing costumes for silent, storm, silent film stars such as Gloria Swanson and Rudolph Valentino. Um, and these are just some examples of actually the costumes that he did design. Um, later, he designed costumes for Broadway before working with Hattie Carmichael for 12 years. There he was a design, designer for her custom order house. In 1940, Norell formed the label Terena Norell with Anthony Terreno, a high-end clothing manufacturer. Originally, Torino had offered Norell a higher salary if Norell's name was not on the label. Norell opted for the smaller salary because he knew having his name out there was more promising for his career. The first collection was launched in 1941. The label was famous for their detailing, simplicity, timeless design, and high quality construction, which paralleled the couture of Paris. During World War II, French fashions weren't available, but Norell correct creations quickly filled the gap and he became a leading New York fashion designer. The ration of, fa of fabric didn't bother him. He designed a, sim a slimmer dropped rate chemise dress reminiscent of his favorite period, the 1920s. Uh, he was the first among the New York designers to introduce a full collection of fashions rather than an assortment of separate pieces. His less um, was more approach created simple necklines and slimming more body conscious designs. The wool jersey dress became his staple of the Terrell Norell label as well as his sailor suit and spider dresses which was based on a sailor suit that he wore as a child. Um, he also used paillettes to create sparkly evening wear and skin tight floor length evening gowns known as mermaid gowns. Um, the mermaid was generously but carefully frosted with thousands of sequins that were hand sewn onto knitted jersey. During the height of Norell's career in the 1960s, his jersey dresses sold for $500, coats and suits for between $16 to $2,100, and the iconic sequin mermaid dresses in every color imaginable for $4,000 which was considered the most expensive dresses in America at the time. It was also in 1940 that Norell was the one that introduced leopard prints. After Terrell's dress death in 1960, Norell brought the company and renamed Norman Norell. Just to show that he really cared about his finished product, Norell was concerned about the quality of his garments, that once he approved the design, no manufacturing changes could be made. By 1960, he also invented culottes. Women led modern lives and wanted to create something that looked more like a skirt, but divided like pants. <coughs> now, um, Norman Norwell had many Hollywood clients, 
um, like Lauren Bacall, Judy Garland, Carol Channing, Dinah Shore, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, and Lady Bird Johnson. But he also um, designed a number of dresses for Marilyn Monroe. Um, one being the um, white satin dress she wore to the premiere of The Seven Year Itch in 1955 and her wedding dress to the marriage to playwright Arthur Miller in 1956. As well as the iconic mermaid, green mermaid dress that she wore to the Golden Globes in 1962. Norrell particularly enjoyed refining Monroe's vampy sex pot image. Norrell was quoted saying, everything had to be skin tight. You had to reinforce every seam or everything would break. <laughs> Norrell was the first designer to receive the American Fashion Critics Award, later known as the Cody Award, in 1943 and again in 1951. He was also the first to be nominated into the Cody Hall of Fame. Norrell taught at the Parsons School of Design throughout his career, and he continued fashion designs until his death in 1972. Now our next designer is Bill Blass. He was known for his impeccable and understated designs, famous for his day wear as well as his evening wear. Like Norrell, Blass was all for expanding into other niches to promote his name as a brand. William Ralph Blass was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1922. He remembered the margins of his school books were covered with doodles of Hollywood inspired fashions instead of notes. Fellow Fort Wayner Carol Lambert was Bill Blass' grown, idol growing up. He would pass by her childhood home on his way to art school when he was in high school. He said that she became more than a muse, but an example of a person living in a small Midwestern town, moving to the city of one's dream and succeeding. By the age of 15, he was selling his dresses in a New York manufacturer for $25 each. He moved to New York in 1939 to attend the Parsons School of Design at the age of 17. <clears throat> During World War II, he enlisted in the 603rd Camouflage Battalion, or better known as the Ghost Army, and put his creative uses to a different use. Bill and his fellow soldiers designed and produced elegant ruses in the form of inflatable tanks, fake bivouacs, and decoy artillery batteries. These deceptions lured the German forces away from where fighting units were actually stationed and provided critical support at the front lines that moved east after D-Day. After the war, um, he returned to New York and worked as a design assistant for a short time for Anne Klein. He eventually joined a small but upscale clothing design and manufacturing firm, first owned by Anna Miller and then later by her brother, Maurice Retinar. Um, Bill worked his way up through the ranks and by 1960 um, the company produced clothing labeled Bill Blass for Maurice Retinar and he began to develop his own clientele and in 1970 he purchased um, Retinar LTD and renamed it Bill Blass LTD. His fashions were known for the precise tailoring, fine fabrics, and a marriage of men's wear details to women's fashion, and the highest level of craftsmanship in every ensemble. Even though Blass went out of the Midwest, he always kept Midwestern values in his designs. He said that clothing line was never couture, but the ultimate ready to wear. He did, not, he did adapt the couture construction techniques to, inter, to interpret his simple designs, which was meant to enhance the female form. <clears throat> Blass's classic style and clean modern cuts made him a favorite with the New York socialites and attended many A-list parties. Diana Verlin, Brooke Astor, and Gloria Vandervelt were all his close friends. Dinah Verlin, who was a fashion columnist and editor, once said about Blass, Indiana, Indiana, don't tell me he's from Indiana. They all come from Indiana. It may be horrible, snowy, desertly place, I don't know. I've never been to the Middle West, but all of you who come from there that I admire, that I love, are good friends of mine, all have a great sort of serenity of spirit. Now, Gloria Vanderbilt, Liza Minnelli, even Jackie Kennedy and Nancy Reagan all wore his designs. A couple of these ladies would also wear designs from the next 
um, designer that I'll be talking about in a few minutes. But one thing that he did love is his plaids and their endless design and possibilities. Take Mr. Furstenberger. <laughs> um, he liked the visual effects um, into structural elements of his clothing. And you can see in here, you know, he's got different kinds of plaids um, in the same ensemble. And he also liked to use saturated chrome yellows, royal blues, and lacquered reds and facings and um, linings of his gowns. But Blass was the master of the bias sheath, draped dresses, recurring themes in his evening wear collections, as well as his most uh, masterful evening ensembles were the beaded and embroidery creations that created old world traditions and service embellishments. So the dress um, on the right here, that is all beaded, which you can't really see um, in the example here. Um, now, Blast is often let out of, left out of sighting of designers who created the American style, which would be like Calvin Klein, um, Ralph Lauren, um, because his clothes were practical, made for the everyday well-to-do person. His designs were catered to the working woman. His looks incorporated Hollywood glamour with sportswear, taking sportswear silhouettes and creating them with luxurious materials and blending um, pieces traditionally <coughs> found in sportswear with the dramatic ball skirts. Um, but what actually put um, Bill Blass on the map and made him a household name for women everywhere was his determination to take clothing on the road. Blast traveled thousands of miles each year, making personal appearances in department stores and boutiques. He got to know the women who defined the social life in cities like Denver and Phoenix. He understood that women wanted and made flattering, flattering clothes for them and not just for his ego. He said, these trips taught me about what works. Black is a New York invention, but in bright sunny cities like Houston and LA, black looks terrible. I can't imagine in any other business. I wanted to go out and meet the customer, and I have. He was also one of the first designers recognized, recognizable enough um, to star in his own advertising and coined the so slogan, blasphemous and um, blasphemy. So he was a pioneer in regards to licensings, and by the mid-1990s, his ready-to-wear empire grossed $9 million annually, and his 97 licensing agreements bearing his name had retail sales of more than $700 million a year. So he went from, you know, cars to perfume to you name it. Um, in his lifetime, Bill Blass won seven Cody Awards and a Fashion Institute of Technology Lifetime Achievement Award. And to build upon his success of the women couture, he was the first designer to create menswear collection in 1967. Blast retired following this showing of his spring 2000 collection. And the last designer is Halston. He was a premier fashion designer that rose to international fame in the 1970s. His designs were um, streamlined, sexy, drapey minimalism for the Studio 54 crowd, and often in gold, lame, and ultra suede. It went back, didn't it? Um, now, he was actually born in Des Moines, Iowa, but his family moved to Evansville at the age of 10 and attended Indiana University briefly. He was born Roy Halston Frowick, and he developed an interest in sewing early on from his grandmother and began creating hats and altering clothing for his mother and sister. In 1952, Halston moved to Chicago, where he attended night courses at the, in the Art Institute of Chicago. But during the day, he worked as a fashion merchandiser for Carson Perry Scott. Not long after, he was able to display some of his hats in the salon on North Michigan Avenue. By 1959, he moved to New York City to take on a design position for the milliner, Lily Duche. Um, within a year, he was hired to serve as a head milliner for the luxury realtor real, real, <laughs> real um, 
Bergdorf Goodman and became the first in-house milliner to design under his own name. By 1961 um, is when he really made um, his mark um, by um, making Jacqueline Kennedy's um, pillbox that she wore to her husband's presidential inauguration. Um, as hats were becoming less fashionable, though, Halston became designing women's wear in 1966. His line was renowned for sexy yet elegant pieces. The collections included um, accessories like hats, scarves, shoes, and jewelry, as well as furs and leather apparel. He opened up his first boutique on Madison Avenue in 1968, and his second boutique opened in Chicago in 1976. Now, Halston lost his, launched his first ready-to-wear line, Halston Limited, in 1969. His designs were simple, minimalist, yet sophisticated, glamorous, and comfortable at the same time. He liked to use soft, luxurious fabrics like silk and chiffon. Halston changed the fitted silhouette and showed the woman's body shape by allowing the natural flow of the fabrics to create its own shape. In, in the fall of 1972, he introduced a simple shirtwaist dress made from ultra suede, um, a fabric that was washable, durable, and beautiful. Um, and then two years later, um, he offered the world his most iconic design, which was the halter dress. Um, and in, it was an interest, in, instant hit um, in the American disco text, giving women a narrow and elongated silhouette. He was also credited for the popularization of the Crafton, um, which he would just use one piece of material um, to create a flattering silhouette in polyurethane and American fashion. He dis expanded his dress offerings over the years to offer fabric styles such as graphic printed slip dresses in polyester, Georgette, and wrap dresses, wrap dresses in um, cashmere. In the fall of 1977, he unveiled what would be called the high-rise um, dress style in wool jersey, charmeuse, chiffon, and velvet fabrics with a tied waist that he said would elongate any figure. He was also one of the first designers to create a unisex line, developing collections with items like fur coats, argyle sweaters, and leather jackets. In 1975, he designed a separate menswear collection. In addition to his disco-inspired clothing, Halston had a robust offering of sh uh, skirt suits for the more prof professional occasion. Um, he, was still, he still brought his signature flair to the sportswear, specifically in 1979 collection that included skirt suits with an asymmetric collar. He said, it really, it's really an abstraction of a collar. It's very graphic. With all the business and luncheons taking place across the table, this is something that attracts attention. Um, now, Halston's friends um, and clients included um, among the most alluring and well-known men and uh, women across the world, including Rita Hayworth, Liza Minnelli, Marlena Dietrich, and Diana Furland. The more popular he became, the more his friends became well known. And this continued into his career, including um, Bianca Jagger and Andy Warhol. Um, but he favored models like Pat Cleveland, Angelica Houston, Beverly Johnson, and Karen Bjornsson. The entourage of the models were called the Halstonettes by a fashion journalist. They appeared together in editorials and ads for Halston's clothing. Um, cosmetics and Halston related events. They often traveled together with Halston, attended his galas, um, acted as muses, and reflected ethnic diversity. As Halston was one of the first major designers in, um, to hire models of different races to walk in his shows and appear in his ads. Now, Halston was known as the first designer to fully license himself as a brand unto itself and his influence went beyond style to reshape the business of fashion. In 1968, from 1968 to 1973, his line earned an estimated $30 million. 
1973, Halston sold his business to um, Norton Simon Inc. for an estimated price of between 11 to $12 million. He remained an executive of the company and it was renamed Halston Enterprise. Through a licensing agreement with J.C. Penney in 1983, um, which was reported $1 billion, he created designs that were accessible to women at a variety of income levels. However, this deal damaged his image as a high-end fashion designer with the retailers um, that felt that his name was become cheapened. In spite of his achievements um, and his increasing drug use um, and failure to meet deadlines, um, it undermined his success. By 1984, he was fired from his own company and lost the right to design and to sell clothes under his own name. However, he did continue to design costumes for his friends. Um, but in his lifetime, he won four Cody Awards for millinery and apparel, and in 1974, he was inducted into the Cody Hall of Fame. But one thing that um, Blass and Halston do have in common was they participated in together um, that really was a huge advancement for the American fashion was the Battle of Versailles in November of 1973. It was a fashion show and fundraiser held at the Palace of Versailles in France. The event was organized by Eleanor Lambert, a prominent fashion publicist, as a way to wait, raise funds for the restoration of the palace. The fashion show featured five American and five French designers pitting um, established French um, fashion house against the upcoming American designers. Now, the event is considered a significant moment in fashion history because it marked a turning point for the American fashion. The French thought that the Americans were merely a sportswear designers, but the designers and the models from the United States were determined to be taken more seriously in the fashion world. The American designers showcased um, innovative and diverse designs using models of different races and body types, which brought a fresh and modern perspective to the runway. The French portion lasted two and a half hours with elaborate backdrops, long ballets and music performances compared to the American portion that lasted 30 minutes. Um, Liza Minnelli performed a Broadway style act um, with a simple backdrop because the Americans were actually doing all their measurements in inches rather than in centimeters, so nothing worked when they got there. Um, but the Americans got a standing ovation twice and this helped establish the American designers as a major player in the global fashion industry. And that's it. <laughs>